Welcome back. I'm very happy to see many of you have your cups of tea still with you because I still have a fairly full one. My last one went cold, so I'd like to slurp a little bit more before beginning the talk. <laughs> it's so lovely to see all your messages. It really is so contagious, you know, one person's joy when expressed just seems to boost my own happiness and I'm sure it's the same for all of us. It really is the snowball effect. A lot of um, appreciation here for Tehani, thoroughly deserved. And also Tehani that you know, one of your, I think one of Tehani's hopes for this was to um, just to bring this Katina ceremony to our awareness, you know, in a sense, educating the community about what it is, what it means. And there's no better way to do that than just to perform, you know, the ceremony, just to have a day where we do come together to celebrate. It's hard to explain why and how it works, but it's just, I think, the fact that we're gathered for such wholesome reasons. The thanks is just overwhelming, you know, all these little messages coming in the box. And we could be focusing our mind on so many other things, but we've chosen to focus it on the beautiful, on the good, on the uplifting. This is all part of the practice, you see. It doesn't only happen in meditation with your eyes closed. This is where we get the juice for the practice. <laughs> this is quite sweet because Mel's recording even while I'm still having my copper, but that's fine, Mel, because I think it gives a friendly, a friendly kind of atmosphere and everybody really is welcome, including all those who will be listening afterwards. <laughs> so I'll just wait a couple more minutes. I can pretend I'm waiting for you, but I see that you're all already here. So I'm just waiting for myself to drink a bit more tea. <laughs> Drunk. Do you want to put something in the chat box? I'll tell you what I was drinking. Lemon grey, lemon tea, Earl grey, herbal tea, jasmine tea. Water. Earl Grey. We've got a lot of Earl Greyers here. Bog standard tea with soy milk. <laughs> Water. Decaf with oat milk. Regular English breakfast. Yogi Christmas tea. Vodka. Wink. I don't believe you. <laughs> Sri Lankan chai. That's very nice. <laughs> British rail as was tea. British rail as well as tea. Chinese oolong. Oh, very sophisticated people we have here. Ajahn Brahm always teases me for my choice of tea. He says, oh, the weather's grey, everything's grey. Even the tea that some people drink is grey. <laughs> okay, so I think we're all ready raring to go. So I'm going to do a little Dhamma talk for you about uh, where our true refuge lies. And it may not be in cup of teas, surprisingly. Often it is in a cup of tea, <laughs> but there's also something higher than that. So many of you took refuge today. You took refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. And there's a very lovely simile that I wanted to read from uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. I don't know, I think he's put these together from places in the texts which talk about refuge. And there are two particularly beautiful similes. The first one compares the Buddha to the sun, for his appearance in the world is like the sun rising over the horizon. His teaching of the true Dhamma is like the net of the sun's rays spreading out over the earth, dispelling the darkness and cold of night, giving warmth and light to all beings. The Sangha is like the beings for whom the darkness of night has been dispelled, who go about their affairs enjoying the warmth and radiance of the sun. 
And the other simile I wanted to share compares the Buddha to a lotus flower, the paragon of beauty and purity. Just as a lotus grows up in a muddy lake but rises above the water and stands in full splendor on soil by the mud, so the Buddha, having grown up in the world, overcomes the world and abides in its mist, untainted by its impurities. The Buddha's teaching of the true Dhamma is like the sweet perfumed fragrance emitted by the lotus flower, giving delight to all. And the Sangha is like the host of bees who collect around the lotus, gather up the pollen and fly off to their hives to transform it into honey. It's very beautiful, isn't it? The way that the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha as refuges work together because really they're aspects of one and the same. I was saying earlier that, you know, in the beginning of the path, these refuges perhaps seem to be things outside of ourselves. You know, the Buddha is this historical figure who lived so long ago. And for some of us, it might be a little bit difficult to really get a sense of who the Buddha was as a person. I think, you know, this sense becomes clearer the more we practice. And also as we study the suttas, we study his own words. Um, but really, the, the purpose of taking refuge in a Buddha is taking refuge in those qualities that the Buddha developed that we also have innately within our hearts. They're intrinsically a part of our own potential that has yet to come to fulfillment. And I think in this way, it's a very beautiful simile when we talk about the Buddha like a lotus who's grown above, grown from the mud, but has emerged from that mud and emerged from the water and now is untouched by the mud and by the impurities of the world. Because without that mud, without the um, difficulties, the struggles, the suffering, the conflict that we face, we don't have a lot of um, incentive to really look for a path. And so, you know, it, this taking refuge begins with recognizing that there is something, there is something to achieve. There is a state beyond the suffering world. There is a state which is unconditioned, you know, which is not subject to the laws of impermanence, suffering and non-self. So these begin as guiding principles, as ideals around which we can, you know, shape our behavior, we can take inspiration from. But ultimately, you know, the, the real refuge is, comes about through internalizing the qualities of the Buddha, the qualities of the Dhamma and the Sangha, so that they become actual places of refuge that we can go to again and again, that we can search out and find within our own hearts. Actual places that we can incline our mind towards to find comfort, to find rest, to find a sense of safety. You know, and as we develop in the path, these, it's almost like the, high, the path towards those places becomes wider and wider. So at first we find it difficult to go get through all the kind of overgrowth and all the fallen logs, you know, all the muddy swamps. Sometimes we get stuck in the mud, but later on we manage to create this path. We keep walking on it again and again so that it becomes like a wide highway. So we can always incline back into those quiet places in the heart. So the whole purpose of taking refuge is to bring our actions, our actions of body, speech and mind more and more closely into alignment, into harmony with our highest ideals represented by the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. And of course, the Buddha represents the great known as Mahapanya Mahapurunika, the great wise one, and the one of great compassion. Yeah, the kind of compassion that really has um, nothing but others' welfare and well-being at heart. And what I really love in the Ratana Sutta, we didn't chant the whole of that today, but we chanted a part of it, is um, the sentence that says, the Buddha attains Nibbana, goes out of samsara, leaves the world for the ultimate benefit of all beings. Nibbana gamim paramam hitaya. The Buddha attains Nibbana, leaves this world of suffering for the benefit of all beings. So not only did he discover the path and teach the path, he actually realized the path and left this suffering world, left, ended suffering once and for all. And again, I really like the way that Bhikkhu Bodhi describes it in one of his uh, essays. He says that the Buddha uproots the defilements. I think he says totally, 
which means that there are none left at all. He uproots them completely, which means he uproots them from the very depth. He uproots the cause of those defilements and he uproots them finally, which means they can never return. And just to think that such a thing is possible to me is just awe-inspiring. And then to start meeting people who have actually walked a significant part of the path, perhaps even to the end, to the final goal of full liberation. And to know that there are such people in this world can be so inspiring, as long as we internalize these refuges and realize that they're just showing us our own potential. That's what they're reflecting back to us. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about this and why it's so important and just kind of try to encourage us to um, strengthen these refuges in our own lives, in our own hearts. And we don't have to talk about ultimates. We don't have to talk about Nibbana being the only and the highest, the real refuge, because there are little refuges we can find along the way. As I was joking in the beginning, even a cup of tea can be a refuge. And that isn't actually a joke. You know, you might be in the middle of a very tense discussion with somebody or, I don't know, about to blow your fuse. You might be feeling like, you know, you've got a lot of work to do and you just can't keep pushing yourself. And you just take that break. You take a cup of tea. It's an act of care. It's an act of kindness. Sometimes just having a pause, putting the brakes on the mind, especially on the defilements, can, can really help to slow things down and to give us another perspective. So much of the suffering, I think, in life is caused by us being tired, being stressed, you know, not giving ourselves that time and space. So anything you can do like this, whether it's making yourself or a loved one a cup of tea or going outside to get some fresh air. My mum very sweetly, when I told her the subject of today, she also offered something she thought would be helpful to everybody. And I wanted to share that because she really loves gardening. And she was saying, you know, with the COVID kind of extending on and on and on and put, uh, more lockdowns on the horizon in England all over the place, and perhaps in other countries too. And also with the nights drawing in, I think the clocks are turning back tonight, so the, the days will be shorter. She said people really need something to look forward to. So what about getting hold of some bulbs, some flower bulbs, and just planting them in the soil so that you know that in the springtime these bulbs will come up and bear fruit, or flowers rather. See, I'm not a gardener. <laughs> well, daffodils, is it fruit? Well... It's kind of a flower. So I think it's a very beautiful simile because to plant those bulbs in the first place re requires a degree of trust. You plant them trusting that when the time is right, they will actually flower. They will actually become beautiful and you know really cheer you up. Little snowdrops come out first usually and then the crocuses and the daffodils. And they come up in their own time, not when we want them to come up right but also we have to plant them carefully we have to plant them in the soil not just throw them on top of the soil and leave them there to rot right and in a similar way whatever we we're given in our lives we can plant that carefully if we see something that has potential we can take a hold of that and plant that in our heart and just keep on adding the fertilizer of mindfulness and kindness the warm rays of the sun of your loving care and leave the results to nature. You don't know when these things are going to grow. It's almost magical in Western Australia in the springtime. Things look like they have no life in them at all. You know, the little shrubs are so hard and, and spiky. It's impossible to believe that they can bring flowers forth. But then all of a sudden, all these different varieties start to, to flower. And all a similar time so on one day you know you get all the little um what do they call them like morning irises this beautiful blue flower and then a couple of days later you might get sundew uh flowers tiny little things on the paths and it's just within a, a couple of days of each other but they all have their own time it's almost like an orchestra you know each instrument kind of plays its tune at the right point in the music and then they're all kind of there together you can't make a bush flower before it's ready to. So just in that same way, we can't kind of force these refuges to, to bring forth the result, but we can keep on putting our 
energy in that direction, keep inclining towards the qualities that the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha represent. Yeah? Towards truth, towards kindness, towards love, selflessness, giving. I always think of one of the great qualities of the Buddha as, as um, a life of service, selfless service. And I've seen that echoed in the life of my own teachers. You know, they serve even at the cost of their own discomfort, but their own discomfort matters very little because they know that the power of this goodness, the power of giving really can't be measured. And the results just continue to spread. So these refuges provide, first of all, a real source of inspiration for us in the path and also a source of direction and guidance. Can you imagine if you'd never heard the teachings of the Buddha? You wouldn't really know where to begin, right? Where would we start? We'd have some kind of sense of what it meant to be a good person or where meaning or purpose lies, but we wouldn't really have the big picture or know how to put the whole path into practice. So the Buddha gives us that direction as soon as we come into contact with those teachings. And part of that direction lies in pointing us inside. You know, the way of the world is to look for happiness, to look for meaning outside of ourselves. But what the Buddha is saying is that the source of happiness and suffering, as well as happiness and suffering themselves, lie inside, not outside of our own body mind. So straight away, the direction inclines against the world. That's what it means by going against the stream. During my personal retreat, of course, I was alone for three whole months. And of course, the usual pattern of anybody's mind is to think in terms of progress, to think in terms of what I'm going to get from this retreat, if it's going to work. You know, I was peaceful last week. Is it going to deepen? What if it goes backwards? And luckily, you know, I have very good teachers. I have a lot of, um, uh, I guess I've been brainwashing myself for many, many years. And so I just keep being reminded of the very simple teaching that, you know, happiness is never looking on. It's always looking inside, going more and more deeply into this moment, into where we are already. And not trying to trade this moment in the hope of something better somewhere else. By doing that, we're just throwing away our lives, literally. You know, you can only ever live in the moment. Everything that you think about as future moments, even things like jhanas and enlightenment, they're only going to be real for you in the present moment. And if you don't know how to stay in that present moment, you'll miss them. You'll miss them time and again. So the first training really is to take refuge in this present moment and to get the proper guidance, yeah? to keep remembering to incline the mind within. Another amazing thing for me about the Buddha's teaching and about being able to take refuge is just to get a sense of meaning and purpose in my life. And even in modern psychology, I think there's something called positive psychology nowadays. Even there, they're starting to identify that happiness is not as important as having meaning and purpose in one's life. In fact, meaning and purpose gives us a different kind of happiness. Eudaimonic, I'm probably pronouncing it wrongly. It's a, it's a kind of happiness, not the hedonistic kind, hedonic happiness, which is based on how you feel, whether you feel good, whether you have pleasant sensations, pleasant emotions. This is a kind of, even the wholesome pleasant emotions are still, they have that pleasant feeling. But the eudaimonic happiness is a kind of happiness that comes from having a sense of purpose a sense of meaning in one's life and it was so interesting for me during the rains retreat to be here alone and to have all these reminders of the world around me you know the garden parties the people in the street going down to the pub with their friends young people mostly making a lot of noise <laughs> and sometimes you really wondered what they were talking about whether it was meaningful for them or whether it was just you know because they had to say something to be cool there's a lot of pressure on people isn't there to be you know to socially conform and to feel like they fit in with the crowd and I just wondered you know what these people are really looking for and whether they have found that perhaps through their university studies in one of the best universities in the world and I just realized how fortunate I really am to be able to truly say, yes, I have a sense of meaning and purpose that goes beyond myself, that even goes beyond this life. 
you know i really have this sense that there are many many lives and this path is a is a many lifetime commitment and that nothing 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 goes waste right it's this simile again of the water tanks which i'm sure i repeat very often we just don't know when the next drop is going to make those tanks full and the water is going to start pouring out from those water tanks we may have a huge tank but we can't see the top but what we can know is that every drop we put in there every time we meet together on a day like this we sit to practice meditation we share kindness we share blessings you know we say kind words to each other we're practicing the path we're putting in these drops in the bucket and as long as there's no terrible leak in that bucket and the leaks are things like breakages of the precepts right so today you've plugged up some of those leaks by reconfirming your commitment to the precepts. As long as they don't leak, drop by drop, the jar gets full. And you don't know whether that happens next week, 10 years, 10 lifetimes, 10 eons. Time is, you know, really a construct. But according to mathematicians and theoretical physicists like Ajahn Brown, they really do have this sense of like the infinity of time. And when we look at it in that perspective, it really takes away any sort of um, unhealthy craving for fast results. I don't think it, uh, for me anyway, it doesn't um, undermine my commitment in any way, because I know that even if it takes a long time to be enlightened, I can do so much good along the way. And always thinking about the future takes us away from the refuge of this present moment. The first place we can really call home. That's the first place we can come back to, isn't it? When we sit down to meditate. All this stuff about being with your breath, being with your body sensations, you know, the state of your mind. What we're really doing is bringing you to the present. We're saying, be aware of whatever's arising now. And in that present, you know, we can find deeper refuges, the refuges of silence. Just being quiet, being alone with yourself. And quite often during this retreat, you know, I would bring up reflections of the Buddha, reflections of the Sangha, especially, because I have a very strong connection to various teachers in my life. Of course, Ajahn Brahm is my main teacher and the one who I've taken dependence upon because I have very strong confidence that he's somebody who embodies the Dhamma. It's almost as though the refuges start out as being something intellectual, something outside, something in your head. And then the closer you get, they start to come into your body, into your heart, until you can actually sense those qualities within yourself, mirrored back to you perhaps by a teacher, but you can start to sense those places in yourself, those potentials. And a really good teacher will always encourage your potential. It's almost as though they're blind to your faults, not in the sense that they don't see them, but there's no need for them to kind of bring it up or mention it even to you because we're all aware of our faults, right? I actually once asked Ajahn Brown, can you tell me what do you think my main weakness is? And his answer was, and he knows me, his answer was just, you should know that for yourself. He just wasn't going to tell me. And I think that's so wise because had I actually received the feedback, I would have gone away and probably felt quite bad about that or felt like there was something I urgently needed to fix. As it is, I feel that I have all the time in the world, so much space, so much a sense of patience, you know, from my teachers and friends to grow in my own time, just like those bulbs just like flowers, you know. Things work themselves out. We meet situations in life that challenge us, that show us, you know, where we're still clinging, where the sense of self is still solidifying. And bit by bit we learn. But I think what's most helpful with, uh, with the refuges and certainly with the Sangha is to really um, be in a community that encourage the goodness that you have inside rather than pulling you down, trying to fix you up. If you want that, you can go to psychotherapy. I think psychotherapy is advanced beyond that now. But, you know, there's the nitty gritty side of things and then there's the bigger picture as well. And I think with Buddhism, with the Dhamma, we're, we're focusing really on cause and effect. 
So one of the things we take refuge in, one of the things we trust in is that results do have effects. Yeah, and that we have some capacity to modify um, both our actions and also those effects. So past karma, you know, past actions, we've done them already. We can't do much about that. But the way that they ripen in this present moment very much depends on how we relate to what's happening right now in the mind. And part of right intention is always to learn to relate to whatever's arising now with a feeling of kindness, acceptance, gentleness, yeah, non-violence, avihimsaka. Non-violence really means a kind of allowing something to be, being very, very gentle and soft with it, not fighting with our mind. So I wanted to talk as well a little bit about how um, the refuges can help to give us a perspective, a perspective on suffering, yeah? perspective on things like impermanence and how we can learn to sort of frame our whole life and our experience in the context of the Four Noble Truths. It can help so much. I mean, for me, when I first heard the Buddha's teaching that he's actually talking about suffering and you know, he's not um, denying its existence. It was such a relief. You know, in our popular culture, so much of the, um, I don't know, the entertainment, the songs, really romanticize life, don't they? You know, I'll find the perfect person and ride off into the sunset. I'll be happy forever with you, baby. <laughs> and we get the most ridiculous expectations that our reality never matches up to. And for me, when I heard the truth, you know, the truth that suffering is a reality, it's, it exists. And that it is caused. Yeah, there's a cause that can be actually overcome, that can be eradicated. I was so relieved that somebody was actually saying it like it was. It's as though all the tension between what I felt was true and what I was being told or, you know, what society was attempting to tell me was true. All that tension just disintegrated. And immediately I felt more aligned with the truth. There wasn't something wrong with me. <laughs> yeah. And this was such a big relief. Of course, you know, this is only the beginning of the noble path because then the Buddha is compassionate enough to point out a path. And that path on, starts with right view. You know, the right view into things like karma, that, you know, we are, that our intention matters. The quality of our, tension, of our intention brings about certain results. If our intention, our actions are based on intentions of kindness and generosity, based on intentions of letting go rather than accumulating, clinging on, then we can be sure that they're leading in positive directions, that we are practicing the noble path. And we can experience the benefit of that right away. Yeah. In meditation, you might have noticed, and I noticed time and again, that sometimes there's just a little bit of resisting whatever's arising. You know, sometimes I can feel that I'm with an experience and that I'm just being aware. But in the back of my mind, I'm not really happy there. You know, there's something a little bit missing. And I just remember this teaching of kindness and gentleness. And first of all, you know, imbuing it with a bit more warmth, greeting it more like the way I'd greet a friend. But also the gentleness can mean that it's almost as though sometimes the mindfulness is like holding on too tightly, too closely to a particular experience. It's just a bit too, um, too attached. And then this gentleness loosens the grip. It just backs off and gives it a little bit more space. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit like I was teaching this morning in the Metta that you move your attention through the body like a very gentle, soothing hand. You know, the hand is there with the experience, but it's not clinging onto it. It's not like fixing to it. It's just very gently soothing the experience. And, and this is another way we can play with our awareness. You know, we can experiment with how close we want to be and, and how much we need to just open out and give things space. These principles apply equally in life, right? It's like if you're with a friend, sometimes you're feeling that you're being empathic, but you're leaning in a bit too much, getting a little bit too involved. And sometimes if somebody's very close to you, maybe like a child or a parent, 
you can just feel that they're um, not able to give that objectivity objectivity in the same way that somebody a little bit less close to the situation would be able to. Yeah. So what you really want is just that sense of perspective and space. And this is what the Four Noble Truths do. They paint a big picture. So you don't take things so personally and you don't have to fix things up, right? It's like Ajahn Chah said when, I mean, Ajahn Chah was um, understood, I think, to have, to have been, become enlightened. I mean, I don't know what stage he was at, who can say, but he was definitely one of the great monks from the forest tradition. And one of his um, great insights and exclamations was, joy at last, to know there's no happiness in the world. And there's this very beautiful photograph of him saying this, I think in England somewhere, and he has his hands up, joy at last, to know there's no happiness in the world. And I think that's just such a beautiful proclamation of the Dhamma, you know, that we can stop investing all our hopes and expectations in the wrong places, in the places that are subject to change. One of the Buddha's insights when he was searching for the, for the path, when, when he was still as yet unenlightened, was that why should I search for things that are su subject to change, being myself subject to change, subject, subject to old age, sickness and death, subject to disintegration? Why should I then seek for the same things what if I seek for something that's beyond these laws of impermanence, that doesn't decay, that doesn't disintegrate? And so he already understood there was something beyond this conditioned world. And this is the beauty of India. I mean, I lived in India for many years and you only have to be there and especially be involved in, you know, maybe meditation circles to realize that this understanding is very much alive. Even with the recluses and the sadhus of all kinds of traditions, they do understand that there's a, something beyond this conditioned world. Of course, the Buddha didn't talk about that as a state as such, as a state of existence. He talked about that as an ending of suffering. Yeah. And it's something that's very hard to understand through words. But what we can know is that the Dhamma is that which leads to peace. It leads to things ceasing. It leads to things settling down. The Dhamma is something that turns us away from the madness of the world, from be being entangled in the world, yeah? away from the fires of craving, away from the anger and aversion of ill will. So anything that leads you towards peace, that inclines the mind towards solitude, simplicity, contentment, you can know that that's the Dhamma, that's the teaching of the Buddha. And that is really where your refuge lies. So this talk has become all over the place and I had this whole thing about discussing the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, but um, <laughs> sometimes it's like that and, and I think it's good to go with it. But I did want to say a little bit more about the Sangha because you know, most of us are already practicing the path and I don't want to kind of get, get too technical about things, but I think the Sangha is also an important one that is often not so well understood. So in terms of the three refuges, the Sangha does mean the community of monastics, monks and nuns. And it means specifically those monks and nuns who have attained things on the path, who have actually realized the, the teachings for themselves who in a sense, like the Buddha, have also come out of the mud and have tasted something beyond this conditioned world. Yeah. So one really lovely analogy is that um, the Buddha is like the person who discovers and realizes the truth. He's like the great physician who gives the, the medicine of the Dhamma. And then the Dhamma is that medicine itself. The Dhamma is the course of treatment that we have to take. So the Dhamma, we can't just leave it on the shelf and say, okay, I'll take it later. It's something that actually has to be applied. We have to actually start the course of treatment. And then the Sangha can be seen as those people who've also already taken the medicine from the Buddha and have already overcome their disease. And because of this, they're able to guide us and give us encouragement. They're able to say, you need to continue taking your medicine. You know, you didn't take your pill today. <laughs> And also give us this example of what happens when you do take that medicine, when you do practice properly. 
So the Sangha are those who like attend to us, who care for us, who encourage us along the way. And they understand the pitfalls also. Perhaps you're, you know, you're taking your medicine and then one month you realize you actually feel worse. But the Sangha are able to say, well, this is natural. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It's just that the path is not a linear process. And sometimes other things come up from the past, right? Perhaps something happened in the past and now it's giving rise to unpleasant results in the present. It doesn't mean that the medicine's not working. It just means that you need to um, persevere. You need to continue to keep inclining the mind towards the Dhamma. Keep on developing kindness, goodness, generosity and love. Yeah, so the Sangha are there to inspire and encourage us along the way. And it's almost as though, you know, these um, teachings start off as being something that you read in the text, and then you start to experience a little bit of them. But seeing the Sangha in the world is almost like seeing the, the Dhamma lived and breathed, quite literally. It's bringing it from an, a concept, from an idea, from something that you're looking toward in the future, to being a tangible reality in the here and now that we can tap into. And I mean, some of the most beautiful memories and, and experiences in my life have just been sitting around somebody who I know is at peace and tapping into that peaceful presence. You know, even if I'm feeling quite agitated, just a few moments sitting around a good teacher, watching the way they maybe interact with people, or sometimes they just sit there quietly and there's this kind of aura that exudes from them and fills the space. It can be incredibly healing, incredibly um, soothing and calming and teaches more than words ever can. You know, so every week I'm having my interviews still with Ajahn Brahm. He's being such an incredible, immense support to me throughout this COVID period. So we meet once a week and we, we just chat about the project, but also about practice. And um, sometimes, even though the, the conversation is wonderful and I learn so much, sometimes I just want to be in his presence, you know? And I'm planning actually at one point to just say, can we sit for a few minutes, first of all? Can we just be quiet and, you know, let me just like tap into that. Also with my first teacher, I remember the fir very first time I met him, he was my preceptor in Burma. It was just a short meeting and uh, he knew we were coming from England to ordain. And I remember asking him for the Vinaya. <laughs> I said, do you have a book, you know, with all the um, Patimoka rules, even though I wasn't going to take full ordination. Um, I was living as though fully ordained as far as I could. So I asked him for this book and he gave me his own personal copy, which was all falling apart. So I thought, wow, this is very precious. I have to really look after it. And uh, and he was one of the first monks I'd ever met. So to me, he was just like a personification of, I guess, the Dhamma and the Sangha and just looked like the perfect monk. But it was actually when we were leaving in a car away from his little city monastery that this overwhelming feeling of peace and well-being came over me. And I was with another person at the time who was ordaining with me. She was a friend. And we looked at each other and said, can you feel something? Like, I'm feeling really happy, like really joyful. And she felt the same. And it started to become a common experience whenever we'd been in this person's presence so that it couldn't be chance. You know, we just feel this kind of very, very tangible sense that somebody was sending us meta. And I know in retrospect that he was. You know, it's something similar to what we're sharing today. I think we can feel a little bit of uplift, a bit of happiness, a bit of joy, yeah? What is that exactly? You know, you can't point to it and say, here it is, but you can feel it in your heart. I read something really sweet by Ajahn Chah the other day. <laughs> he said that sometimes people come to him and say, so, you know, if there's a, if there's a future life, can you show it to me? Where is it? And he said... Uh, He's always very smart and a bit cheeky. He said, well, is there a tomorrow? If so, can you show me tomorrow? Can you show it to me? <laughs> and I thought that was great because sometimes these things are beyond what we can understand, what we can comprehend with our senses. They're things that are beyond, you know, the usual conditioned world. 
but that doesn't make them any less real, any less possible. And so really taking refuge is kind of acknowledging that there is something, there may be something beyond what we can currently verify from our own experience and keeping our hearts and minds open to that, yeah? So the Sangha is a very beautiful reminder of this. And, um, and of course, you know, this is the, the noble Sangha who embody as well as preserve the teachings. But even in communities like this, where we're still practicing, where we're on the path together, this is also a sense of community, a sense of spiritual friendship and support. And it's so important to know that that's there and that we can tap into that. We can get encouragement, you know, we can check in and, you know, if we're feeling a bit low, we know we're not alone. We know there are other people who, you know, are on the same wavelength, who are looking for similar things in their lives. And this is incredibly supportive. And I had a really strong sense of the Sangha being with me throughout my Reigns retreat, even though, you know, I, I was literally on my own. I had my interviews with my teacher and I had all the loving support of everybody here. You know, whether you know it or not, whether you've been to these sessions or not, you're all part of this group just by merely showing up. Yeah? And some of you are also sending food to me every week. I mean, I wouldn't be looking kind of rosy and, and well and plump if, if that hadn't been the case. I would have felt quite dejected most probably. But the food was really food for the heart because it wasn't just the food itself. It was the kindness and the efforts that you'd gone to to express your care this way. And it means everything. It really means everything. And the other thing that occurred to me is that part of my joy in receiving the food, especially from people who perhaps haven't done this before, is that I know by virtue of being in the ordained Sangha, by virtue of being a monastic, we're teaching different aspects of the path. If you only go to meditation centers, you don't get that opportunity. Not quite in the same way. There may be a monetary exchange, but it's not the same as feeding somebody and directly contributing to their meditation in a way that's going to then lead towards developing communities, developing places for practice. So the Buddha taught that the noble path has to be practiced completely every limb of it, not only the meditation. And you're already practicing generosity, practicing, in a sense, the sense restraint, using your minds in ways that inclines it towards the wholesome and the good. So I'm really pleased about this because I think it brings another element to practice, one that you may be starting to get a feel for. Because I know from Derek that there were lots of little messages coming in saying that, you know, some of you are really looking forward to feeding me. And really, it's not about just knowing that I'm getting fed. It's the very act of being able to care for somebody. Yeah, It's the same thing that keeps people alive, say, in a nursing home. Yeah, It can be very, uh, people can feel very dejected, very alone. But if you give people something to care for, even a plant, it actually increases people's lifespan. It gives them something to wake up for. There's something else to tend. And this is how we can really stay connected and feel that sense of meaning in our lives. And I just wanted to end this talk by bringing it all back around to ourselves. Because I started by saying that these refuges are something that initially seem to be outside of us. And even with the Sangha, you know, this is a refuge which is in a sense external to ourselves. But really the true refuge is when we're alone and we can actually bring up the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha in our heart. As I say, you know, when I went into my retreat, none of you were with me. I didn't really think about you, quite honestly, not, I mean, a little bit, you know, sometimes people came to my mind. But what it really was, was the essence of what, of your goodness. It was the essence of what community represents. Yeah. When I contemplate the Buddha, he's not there with me. I don't know what he really looked like. I don't really know what the sound of his voice was or who he was as a person. I don't really know how I would feel around such a being. But I can evoke impressions of the Buddha from the places I've been to on pilgrimage, from the things that I've read, from the teachers that I meet in my life, and from how it feels to be on this path, to be around such people. 
so I can evoke that within myself and those refuges therefore are always within me so even though I was alone I actually had everything I needed right here and I think this is so beautiful and gives so much confidence because ultimately we enter this world alone when we're born and we leave it alone when we die you know and and sometimes I was doing a death contemplation during my practice and I found it really helped me to get a perspective again on, on what I'm doing in my life, the parts of my life that are really valuable and the parts that I don't need to think about so much. What do we really take with us at the time of death? It's not only the last thought as they teach in the Abhidhamma, it's actually all the accumulated goodness that you've generated throughout your life. And sometimes I was doing these death contemplations, imagining that I was actually coming to the last few breaths. And at, at that time of coming to those last few breaths, you know, I was encouraging myself or I was listening to a guided meditation, which was saying, you know, imagine now that it's just a really beautiful thing to let go. It's a really beautiful thing. And you feel this sense of contentment and gratitude coming over you, knowing that you've lived a good life. And then what I would do from that place, from that perspective of feeling so content with the life that I'd lived, was to look back on my life today. And from the perspective of death, what really matters? What is really important? What can I really feel happy about? And what are the things that I can put down? The things that are not going to be a refuge. You know, the struggles that I may have at an interpersonal level with somebody the way somebody may have spoken to me in a way I didn't appreciate. This is not going to be important. You know, this is not a refuge. This is not a place I want to incline my mind. But the way that I tried to care for people, you know, the kindness that I received, sitting around a teacher who only has my own welfare at heart, who wants nothing from me. It's not an exchange. It's a one-way traffic. These are the things that I can really take with me. And these are the things that, in a sense, are the essence of this life. So I really want to encourage everybody to, to look for where you find refuge, for what refuge means to you. And to know that you have everything it takes inside. It's all there. It's all there. It's just a matter of learning to incline the mind in the right direction towards goodness freedom and peace yeah so that's enough for me i hope that made sense because from my perspective it went all over the place <laughs> but it's interesting one thing i'm noticing after this retreat is that um there's more trust about just speaking and if it hits home that's good if not i did my best so I feel a lot of joy because I feel like I'm just with such a wonderful community who do practice all these things we've been talking about. You know, you're always looking with rose tinted glasses at everybody in this community, bringing out the goodness, expressing gratitude and thanks. And this is really wonderful. So we still have time for some communication, which I always feel is the nicest part of the day. And. Uh,